Are you ready to travel? Fasten your seatbelts then. We shall go to Bethlehem, you and I. Only about eight miles from the city of Jerusalem is the little village of Bethlehem. And for your interest's sake, for your political interest's sake, this is a town that's ruled over by communists. And I mean that uh, not so much in the, in the dogmatic sense as in sort of the political way in which it's organized and governed. Our Lord Jesus said that a city set up on a hill cannot be hidden. It was the custom in Bible times during the time of Christ and a long while prior to that to build the village or the city atop a hill. You find the same thing at Jerusalem, for instance. The reason for that was that travelers during the nighttime would watch for the flickering lanterns and candles, and they would make their way home in that way, long before flashlights, of course, and um, when a torch, perhaps, would only burn for just a few minutes. Our Lord Jesus then, you remember, said, a city that is set upon a hill cannot be hidden. And so it is here in the city of Bethlehem. Now, they call this field from which we're taking our first view the shepherd's field. And the Bible says, the shepherds watched their flocks by night. And an angel choir began to sing over and above a manger, and a brilliant light began to shine. And we still today sing, don't we? O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Now there is a miracle, ladies and gentlemen, in the birth of our Lord Jesus having happened at Bethlehem. Back in the Old Testament times, it said from the prophecy given 700 years before the birth of Jesus, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth to me, who is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Now let's suppose you and I are tourists, and it's 2,000 years back to the future, and we're walking up and down the streets of Nazareth, 50 miles, yes, nearly 70 miles from here, and we see a beautiful young lady, and she's in the final trimester of pregnancy. And I might say to you, where do you think this baby's going to be born? What is your best guess? And you would say to me, I'll lay odds, the baby's going to be born right here. This girl isn't going anywhere of distance, not in her advanced condition, not with the modes of travel that they have here. And you know what happened. It was the Roman governor, Pilate, who following the orders from the city of Rome made the decree that required every head of house to go back to the place of his birth so that the census, the head count could be taken and the taxes collected. And Jesus, through his earthly father, Joseph, was related to King David. Uh, Joseph was uh, a relative of King David, and the city of Bethlehem is called still today the city of David. We're going to turn around now, just 180 degrees, and look at uh, a housing development. This is a new neighborhood, a subdivision. That's the best way to say it. This is a new subdivision just on the outskirts of the city of Bethlehem. You can see the houses are built in what we might call the Santa Fe style, like down in the southwest deserts of the United States. The roofs are flat, and they have patios up on the roof where they'll sometimes take their meals in the evening, of the cool of the day particularly, and they need not worry about the rain because there's very, very little rain here. The Bible does speak about the early and the latter rain in both Old and New Testaments. So there does come a bit of rain in the spring, and they take advantage of that in order to sprout the seeds in the crop, and then the latter rain or the fall rain that brings the crops to fruition and brings them ready to harvest. We're ready then to go into the village itself. We have moved together, you and I, down to the end of King David Street to Manger Square, in the center of which is the Church of the Nativity. For hundreds and hundreds of years, it's been said that this is where Jesus was born. Can we prove that? No. On the other hand, the historical tradition is very early. In other words, from just a few years after the ascension of Jesus, 
folks were saying that this is the spot where Jesus was born. Well, we can't be sure of that. We can be sure that it was the mother of the Roman Emperor Constantine, the first of the emperors to claim to be a Christian, who came here and built the church over the presumed site of the birthplace of Jesus. And we're going to go inside and see that site in just a little bit. Helena built other churches throughout the Near East and throughout Europe, for that matter. But this church, ladies and gentlemen, is the only Christian church in the Middle East that was not destroyed by invading Persians in around 614 thereabouts. They determined to be rid of Christianity by destroying the Christian churches. And so they would go to them and go inside with their animals, camels, horses, have a rodeo, at the end of which they pulled down the altar and smashed it, and then they would either knock the building down with force of hammers and animals, or if it was burnable, they would set it afire. But this one was saved, and in a little while we're going to see why and talk about the miracle that saved the place. Before you can go inside here, ladies and gentlemen, you must go now through one of those metal detectors, just like the one that's at the airport and tragically now in many of the high schools and other public buildings. This part of the world gave birth to three great major world religions. The first, of course, was Judaism, and the second was Christianity, and the third was the faith of Islam. And that is why this area is called the Holy Land not just for Christians or Jews, but also for followers of Islam. And that's a part of the struggle out in this part of the world still till this very day. And so folk come here from all over the world. They come from the United States with a Christian background. They come from the areas of Europe where there are lots and lots of Jews or Jewish ghettos. And they come from the world of Islam, which is now not only in the Middle East and the Far East, but down in South and Central America and out in the Philippines and a host of other places as well. And you never know who's coming. And so this is a place where there could very well be some tragedies, some terrorism and that sort of thing. And so they're very, very careful whom they let in. And you must go through the metal detectors as we have just mentioned a bit ago. All right? We see the guards here with their automatic weapons slung over their shoulders. And what you can't see, I'll tell you, also at the sides of these Israeli soldiers is the most... Um, the most reliable, they claim, automatic weapon and can be made fully automatic, the Uzi. That brrrr gun, you know, and the gang people love those. And, um, and so they're guarded highly by police force when they can. Now we've moved up to the entrance and I want you folks to look up at the very top of the screen and there you'll see a big lentil beam. That big stone slab was the top of the original door. Everything beneath that was the original door of entry to this church, the Church of the Nativity. And then they closed it off. Down toward the bottom of the screen, you'll see an arch. This then was the second entry. And I think in our next picture, we have even a better view of it. There it is. You can see the arch about mid-screen there. That was the second doorway. But today the doorway is very low. You see it down toward the very bottom of the screen. Now my buddy Ben is standing there, and Ben is not a particularly large man. He stands about five feet and ten and a half inches, I suppose. And you can see that the entry door is way below his shoulder. Now, if you were to ask the folks here, why has the door been made so very low, the likelihood is that your tour guide will give you this answer and this reasoning. This is such a holy place. This is such a special place that we want the folk who go inside to go in an attitude of reverence. We want them to go inside with a bowed head. And so even a child, in order to get inside without banging the head, has to bend over. And while they'll tell you that, I think that's not the real reason for the lowering of the door again and again and again. We mentioned a bit ago that when the invading Persians would come to these holy places, they would go inside with their camels and have a rodeo. And so they made the door so small you couldn't ride a camel inside. And then they began to go inside with horses. And so they made the door so low 
you couldn't ride a goat inside. Couldn't have a goat rodeo in here. And that, I think, is the real reason for the making of the doorway smaller and smaller and smaller still. We step inside now and we see the contrast, the beauty. The outside is rather plain. In fact, a little austere, but the inside is really very, very lovely in its restorative condition. And for your interest sake, interest sake, the architecture style is Byzantine. And I think on another evening, we mentioned that uh, Turkey today is ancient Byzantium, and that's where the East meets the West, and when the when and where the influence of various styles of architecture came together. But this one is largely Byzantine. And up near the front is the altar beneath which they say Jesus was born. But before we go to pay attention to that, I want you to look up at the top, and you will see on either side a row of windows. There they are. Opposite side, the same. Beneath those windows, there once were frescoes. A fresco, ladies and gentlemen, you probably know, is a painting upon a plastered wall. The paintings upon the wall here told the story of the birth of Jesus. And in the first frame, you saw a family, a man leading a little donkey, and on the back of that, a pregnant wife. And then in the next frame, you saw a manger, and the cattle and the sheep gathered round, and then in the final frame, a little baby who's been placed in the manger, the story of the nativity, hence the name of the church, the church of the nativity. Now we mentioned that most of the other churches were destroyed by the invaders in around 614 to 17, right in through there, but this one was saved. It was not destroyed, and I'm going to tell you why and how. When the invading Persians, and by the way, what do we today call Persia? What do we call it today? Iraq. Iraq, exactly. A portion of Iran maybe as well, but largely it's Iraq or Iraq. Either way you say it, I guess, is correct. When, when they came in here ready to have a rodeo and smash the place down, they looked up beneath the windows and they saw the paintings. And in one of the scenes, there were three kings. Now, the Bible doesn't say that there were three. It does say there were three gifts, you remember? One, a gift of gold. One, a gift of frankincense. And yet another, the gift of myrrh. But when we sing about it today, we sing, we three kings of Orient are bearing gifts, we travel afar. And so in the early painting here, there were three kings from Persia who are bringing gifts to this baby. And the invaders then, in 614, around in there, said, look, our forebears came here and they worshiped here. There was something special, something sacred here that they recognized. Therefore then, we're going to save it. And the paintings saved the church. Now, what happened to the paintings? That's the next question, because they've been gone for a long, long while. The original tiles of the roof were made of lead. Now, that's not so unusual. Many places in Europe, you'll find buildings with lead tiles. Up until more recently, we've discovered that lead can make you unwell if you drink the water and the runoff and all that sort of thing. And tragically, uh, that has polluted some of our most lovely and most pristine lakes here in the Pacific Northwest. But in any event, the original tiles or shingles were made of lead. And lead makes a wonderful shingle. It'll turn the water forever, but it has another value, that being the making of bullets. And every time a war would break out here, someone would get a ladder and get up on the roof and pull off a few shingles and throw them down and melt them and make bullets. And tragically, they didn't replace the shingles. And over the years, the water came in and destroyed the paintings. But, um, but the story is still being told to everyone who comes to visit here. Well, we're going to move up now to the altar and then go down a little staircase into what I suppose we would call the basement. And as we do this, I'm going to just share a thought with you. We, because of the things we've seen in church or, or in our early training or perhaps in school, the nativity scene leaves in our mind a picture of a bat and board building, doesn't it? Maybe one by twelves with, you know, bats along the seams. 
and two before Shaq or some such thing as that. Well, that's not necessarily the way it was. Still today, in this part of the world, when bad weather comes, they will put the sheep and the cows and the oxen and the mules and the burrows inside natural caves or grottos to get them out of the weather. And maybe on another evening we will see the evidence of that, but they're still doing it. We'll see the animals back inside. So it is very likely that instead of our Lord's having been born in what we traditionally think of as a manger or a little barn, He was born inside a natural cave into which they would put the animals during bad weather. Now, while we can't be 100% sure that this is where Jesus was born, we can be absolutely certain that it was here in this grotto, before it was made lovely and decorated as you see it now, it was in this grotto that a Christian man came to do a work of great uh, biblical importance. This guy knew the original languages of the Bible as if they'd been his mother tongue. His name was Jerome, and often today he's referred to as Saint Jerome. At the time of the Jerome, the time of Jerome in the fourth, the mid fourth century, the language of the world was, of course, the Latin. For Rome ruled the world for hundreds of years. The language of Rome was the Latin language, but there was no Latin Bible. The Bible still was in its original languages, the Hebrew of the Old Testament and the Greek, a bit of Sanskrit perhaps, of the New Testament. But there was no Bible for the common man. The priests, the church leaders were schooled in the Latin, and they then read the Bible, and sometimes they misquoted it. And uh, we could expect that, I suppose, to some degree. But in any event, Jerome had this great burden to give the people the Bible in their own language. And so he decided there was no better place to find inspiration than here in the grotto where they say Jesus was born. And so he sequestered himself, literally, had himself locked inside, came out only for reasons of emergency. His meals were brought here to him. And for months and months and months, he laboriously translated the Bible word for word for word from the Old Testament Hebrew, the New Testament Greek, into the Latin language. Now, because he was such a scholar, because he did his work so early and so meticulously, still today, when any new translation of the Bible is made, the folks go back and check themselves out word by word by word with St. Jerome's Latin Vulgate. That's the way it's known today. If you look it up in the encyclopedia or on your internet, Jerome's Latin Vulgate. And that word Vulgate, by the way, originates from the word vulgar, which doesn't at its base mean nasty or naughty, but rather that which is common. That is which, that which is for the common man, the blue collar guy. That's the idea. And so the Bible was made available to the common man right here in this place that I consider special and holy if for no other reason than that. We owe to Jerome a great debt of gratitude. Whether the background is Catholic or some branch of Protestantism, he was a great man of God and did a great missionary work. Now we have left the village of Bethlehem, headed back toward Jerusalem. But before we get into the town of Jerusalem, we see a side road. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the Jericho Road. Do you remember the story that Jesus told? A certain man, he said, went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among thieves. Now the context for the telling of the story was this, of course. There was a scribe, and in our parlance today, we would probably call him an attorney, a man of letters. And he thought that he would trap Jesus. But Jesus had been preaching a gospel based on grace and love. And so he thought he would stand up and ask Jesus a question that would find him in a trap, catch him in a catch-22, if you please. 
He was sure that if Jesus gave answer to his question based on love and grace, he would say, well, but what about the law? And if on the other hand, Jesus answered with an answer that was based on law, the attorney would have said, but what about your teaching of love and grace? And so instead of being trapped in either trap, Jesus told the story, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. What was the attorney's question? What was the trap that he fixed? He stood up in the midst of a crowd and said, Lord, I want you to tell me, who is my neighbor? That question is still being asked today, isn't it? To whom do I have any responsibility? What do I owe him or anyone in humanity? Who is my neighbor? And Jesus said, a certain man. Now listen, my dears, in the first sentence of the answer of Jesus, he forever settled the issue. Jesus said, if he's a part of the human race, and by the way, Jesus purposefully in answer used the word anthropos. That's the translation from a certain anthropos. And it's from that word that we have our word anthropology, the origins of all men and all races. And so Jesus said, if he's a man, if he stands upright, if he stands on two feet, regardless of the origin of his birth, regardless of the color of his skin, if he's a part of the human race, he is your neighbor. And then he went on to tell the story. This man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves. And it was no idle phrase that Jesus used. A certain man went down. Because Jerusalem sits atop Mount Zion, nearly 3,000 feet in elevation, while Jericho, only 12 miles distant as the crow flies, is the lowest place on earth not covered with water. It's about 800 feet below sea level. And so to go from Jerusalem to Jericho, you're going to drop in elevation nearly 4,000 feet. In order to make the, the drop in that short distance, the old highway had many twists and turns, and we today would refer to them as switchbacks, wouldn't we? Yeah, those kind of places where they make the kids car sick. Any of you folks have a problem with getting car sick? Yeah, have you ever known of folks that had to sit in the front seat, couldn't sit in the back seat? Well, Lyle has to drive. <laughs> I have, and sometimes I make myself sick. Maybe someday I'll learn how to drive. But in any event, there, there were these hairpin curves, these switchbacks. And in the rocks and bushes on the uphill side of the switchback, the robbers and the brigands and the bad guys would hide out. And when they found a fellow coming along, maybe an elderly couple or maybe someone alone, they would come out from the brush and jump upon them and beat them up and often take their lives and take their possessions at the same time. In the story that Jesus tells, the certain man is a Samaritan. Now, while they were distant cousins, the Jew and the Samaritan were bitter, bitter enemies. In fact, when the Jew referred to the Samaritan, he would often refer to him as a dog. And he wasn't talking about that sweet little lap animal, but rather those mangy curs that eat out of the garbage dump and run wild through the back alleys. A certain man fell among thieves, and he was beaten up. And the man who was robbed and beaten was a Jew, and everyone knew that. And then Jesus has coming down this road, going from Jerusalem to Jericho, a scribe, a, a church officer, a church attorney. And he obviously sees the man wounded and dying, and he goes right on down the road. And then the next passerby is a temple priest. And he certainly sees the man because he makes an effort to go around him. And it may well have been his thought, what should I do? He may have paused and pondered, what ought I do? Here's this guy that, that needs help. He's bleeding and all. And... But on the other hand, down at the temple in Jericho, there are 300 folks waiting for my blessing and my sermon, my prayers. Should I help the one guy or should I go help the 300? Well, I better go help the 300. And so he purposefully walked by the wounded man. And the third traveler was the Samaritan. He stops, gets off his little donkey, 
and binds the man's wounds, staunches the bleeding, perhaps pours oil upon his sores, and then he has to load the man on his little animal and lead him to the Good Samaritan Inn. And for hundreds and hundreds of years, they've been saying that this is that inn. Can we be sure? No, but again, the tradition is early. And many good scholars, careful scholars, believe that this is the place. And when he comes to the innkeeper, he turns the man over to his care, and he says to him, here is money. If this isn't sufficient, in a few days I'll be coming by here again, and I will pay you then the balance. What he's saying is, don't worry about the money, but worry about the man. The Good Samaritan. Well, as we go toward the city, we want to notice one or two other things. Here is the tomb, ladies and gentlemen, of Rebekah. You remember how Isaac uh, was um, granted his wife, beautiful girl, and Abraham's hired man went off into the far country, and, and the test was if she brings water. So, you remember the story? And oh, how Isaac loved her. And when she died, he buried her between Jerusalem and Jericho. And Jewish folks and Christian folks and people just interested in history stop here and pay their respects at the tomb of Rebekah. And as we go again further toward the city of Jerusalem, we see some Palestinians working out in their grain fields. Now, we talked together our second night here about the conflict between the Palestinians and the Iranians and the Iraqis and the Jews and about the potential of Armageddon, all of that sort of thing. And so in picture tonight, I'm going to share with you a bit of the reality of that conflict. Here is a Palestinian lady. That means that she and her husband are Arabs who were born in the Holy Land. And their father, forefathers before them were born here in the Holy Land. And this lady is out in the afternoon heat cutting the grain with a hand scythe in the same way that their forebears have harvested back to the times of Isaiah and Jeremiah and probably before that. And then after the harvesting is done, after the grain has been cut, they will carry it to the place of winnowing. And here is the husband. He's had a little donkey to walk upon the grain that's fallen upon the hard stone floor, and the footprint, the, the hoof prints of the little animal have shredded off the hulls, and, and when the afternoon breeze blows, and they have to do the worst part of the work in the afternoon, in the afternoon heat, you understand, because that's when the breeze comes up, then he throws the wheat up into the chaff, rather, the straw up into the air, and the kernels of grain fall back down to the threshing floor, and the wind blows the chaff away. Nowadays, they set up some pretty big fans to do the same thing, and they do it in the cool of the evening. But often they're doing it still in this style, in the same way that they have done for hundreds, yes, thousands of years. And then they carry tremendous burdens into the marketplace. Now, while the Palestinian is farming like this with hand implements and by the sweat of the brow and the aching back, their Jewish neighbor in the adjoining field or in the field across the road is harvesting his crop as he drives an air-conditioned John Deere tractor and has stereo headphones upon his ears. I want to thank you for traveling with me tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. We've read a number of verses from the last book for those who live in the last days, but we've not read this one as yet. So we're going to begin at the very first verse, the first chapter of the book for those who live in the last days, the book of Revelation. The prophet without honor, let's read about him, shall we? Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. Here it says, this is the revelation of John the disciple, which God get What? I have to check you out from time to time. It's the revelation of whom then? Jesus. Of Jesus Christ. I need to pause here for just a minute. I remember not so terribly long ago talking to a pastor who said, in my church, I never allow a scripture to be read from the revelation. 
I won't permit it. He said, it's a book that's just filled with hocus pocus. It's a book with strange symbols and all kinds of weirdness. And, and he said, I, I just won't allow it read in my church. And I didn't say it, but I was thinking, what a tragedy. What a real tragedy. Because this is not only the book for those who live in the last days. This is the only one of the 66 books that make up our Bible in which you find a promise given to those who will read it and take advantage of it. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Some of my preacher friends love to preach from the Gospel of John, and some others love the book of Romans because it's so clear on righteousness by faith. Still others like the book of Galatians and, and are scholars after the pattern of the Apostle Paul. But I'm here to tell you folks tonight that after 40 plus years of study, I am absolutely convinced that righteousness by faith is as clearly taught in this book as it is in any other. The Pauline writings of those of Peter or John or any other God gospel, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Where do we find him in the first three chapters? We find our Lord Jesus walking among the golden candlesticks, those lights that represent his people, his churches. And so that's why we sing this little light of mine. He's the senior pastor with the shepherd's heart. And, and so he gives those special messages to the various churches, the church at Philadelphia. You thought that you were alone oftentimes, but in the darkest hour, I was right there with you. And to the church of Thyatira, and to this church where Satan's seat is, I know the struggles that you've been through. I know the difficulties you've had to face. I know that there were dark days when you thought that you were all alone in the world, but I was right there with you. And then he comes to the last church, the church of Laodicea. And these churches, I believe, by the way, have to do with time periods. And the last one is Laodicea. And I believe the message is for you and for me. And it talks about Luke warmness, and we're going to be relating that idea as we go further as well. But what Jesus is saying to us is, during those last days, during those really difficult times, when the weather is foul, and there are diseases, and there are tornadoes, and there are plagues, and there are earthquakes, in all of these different places, please know just as surely I was with, as I was with the folks at Thyatira, just as surely as I was with the people in Philadelphia, I'm going to be right beside you. That's Jesus in the first three chapters of Revelation. We come over to chapters 5 and 6 and 7, 8, the first verses, and we find a crisis now. There's a book that holds evidence, it holds information for the very last days. It's a book that if read and understood could help the folks prepare spiritual preparation largely. But there's no one that knows how to read the book. And more than that, if one found could read the book, he'd be unable to open it because the thing is sealed up with seven seals. And we could today liken it to seven combination locks. And when this thing passed before John in vision, it was so real to him, it was so terrifying before him that he cried. I wept a lot, he said, because it was found no man. And then there came a cry, stop, stop your weeping. Hush it up, now wipe your tears, John, for we have found one. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, Revelation chapter 5 and the fifth verse. He not only knows the combinations, he knows how to read the book. And Jesus then unfolds the future. Jesus comes to the rescue, riding upon the white horse. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. You find him then again as the dragon slayer in chapters 11, 12, and 13. And then a bit further, you find him chapters 19 and 20 as the bridegroom riding down the corridor of space, coming with a crown on his head and a scepter in his hand, coming to marry his bride and to take her to be eternally in the Father's house. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Shall we read on chapter 1 and the verse verse? Verse 1 of Revelation 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show the servants the things that would shortly come to pass. He sent and signified it by his angel unto the servant John. And John bare record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all the things that he saw. Blessed then. And by the way, that word that is blessed has a more basic meaning. And we today could translate it by saying happy. Happy, contented. Blessed, happy, and contented then 
is the one that reads, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep the words that are written therein. I've had on many occasions folks come to me and say, you know, Lyle, I, I, I don't know why you like the book of Revelation because it's so scary. I mean, it has all those weird things and beasts and horns and all of those strange symbols. It's just frightening to me. And I say to them, oh, no, no, it's not frightening. Happy are they, peaceful are they, blessed are they who read and understand, for the time is at hand. I want to talk to you a little bit about the whole idea of rejecting the Jesus of Revelation. And we're going to talk about the result of it all and the reasoning behind a lot of it, and it's not necessarily good news. You know, it often comes to my mind that as we near the last days, as there come more troubles and trials and temptations and difficulties and diseases and, and pestilences and all of the rest, folks would become more serious. Though we'd see the churches overflowing on worship morning, but the reverse, here in the United States at least, seems to be the case. As you go to the average place of worship on worship morning, and you'll find lots and lots and lots of empty pews. And our Lord himself said that folks would become more secular and more humanistic and less interested in spiritual things as you get down near the end of time. We somehow seem to want to defend our sins because our Lord Jesus and the Word that is His condemns our lifestyle. We rejected His honesty. Whether it comes to filling out our taxes or doing something else, you've seen, by the way, the tests, haven't you, where they will drop a $5 bill in the parking lot or maybe in the aisle of the grocery store just to see how many folks are willing to turn it in? Well, they're not so very many anymore. We've rejected his honesty. We've rejected his sexual purity. And we have turned away from the truths of his word. Many have described our day and age as hedonistic. And I decided this morning as I studied a bit that I would look that up again for my own sake. And so I went to Mr. Webster and I looked up hedonism and this is what I found. It's a devotion to pleasure, a total self-gratification attitude. Well, it seems to me that that pretty much identifies our society. Doesn't it seem that way to you? Yeah. God said it would be like this in the end time. I want you please to open your Bibles with me to a passage that we've read before. It's just before the Revelation, just before the three little letters of John, 2 Peter chapter 3. We alluded to this passage on another occasion, but we must of necessity do it again tonight. 2 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to notice beginning at the third verse. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Know this that there will come in the last days scoffers who are walking after their own lusts, saying, where is the prophecy of his promise, uh, rather, where is the promise of his coming forth? Since our fathers fell asleep, all things continue just as they were from the very beginning. Now you go back to the first of the chapter, and you see there, in 2 Peter chapter 1, well, the first chapter, in verses 19 and 20, just the reverse from that, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto we do well to take heed, like the light that shines in the dark place. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to go on record to say to you tonight that Lyle has a purpose-driven life. And I've been asked again and again if I've read this book or that book about having Christian purpose in your life, and my answer has always been the same. No, I haven't, because since the day Jesus called me and gave me my ministry... My life has been purpose-driven, and it's going to continue to be. And one of the things that has impressed me as I've come near and near to Jesus is his fulfilled prophecy. I think that this is my greatest reason, really, for being a Christian, the certainty of the prophecy, this sure word of prophecy, whereunto we do well to take heed. The atheism and the, and the disbelief, is not only to be found out in Hollywood, as we mentioned, but it's tragically somehow moved inside the church. And sometimes it's referred to as the new theology, and it's almost always a watering down of that which was there before. The easy gospel, come to the altar and get saved, and then just go do whatever you want to do. If you want to divorce that girl and take that one, why, go ahead and do it. If you want to keep on drinking and beating up on the neighbors, go ahead and do it. It's all right. 
And if you say anything contrary to that these days, someone is bound to be offended. You make almost any statement from God's Word, and the folks will say to you, well, now look, I'm going to go check it out with my preacher. I'm going to go ask my preacher what it says about it all. You know what I think we ought to do? We ought not to check the Bible out with the preacher. We ought to check the preacher out with the Bible. Yeah. And that includes certainly this one. Not so terribly long ago, I climbed the cliffs on the west side of the Dead Sea to go inside the caves of Qumran. Kirbet Qumran, if you look it up in your dictionary. In 1947, a Bedouin boy, a little goat herder boy, was tending the herd along the base of the cliffs when he began to just entertain himself to throw rocks up inside those caves. And when he threw one, it went right inside, bullseye, and he heard the smashing uh, like the breaking of glass. And so he climbed up there and went inside, and he found earthen jugs with wax stoppers inside which there were ancient scrolls. And tragically, he and his family sold the whole thing for just a pittance. I think at the time, it amounted to what today would be about $40 the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the news was flashed around the world. We now have copies of the Bi books of the Bible that date back to the time of Isaiah and Jeremiah. And then some research was done to discover that the scrolls most likely were placed there at the time that Titus Vespasian moved in on Jerusalem in 70 A.D. and tore the place apart. And the folks took the sacred word, took those holy scrolls, and hid them in the caves and made them to be in watertight and airtight vessels for their preservation. They took some of these scrolls and carefully, carefully put them in humidity-controlled rooms, just exactly the right temperature to soften them up and make them more pliable. And then they unrolled the first one. And as they unrolled the first scroll, it opened to Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8. Let's turn there together, shall we? It's really important that we do it. Isaiah chapter 40. And verse 8, it's just before Jeremiah and Ezekiel, chapter 40 of Isaiah and the 8th verse. Here's what they found when they unrolled the scroll. Chapter 40 and verse 8. The grass withers and the flowers will fade, but the Word of God lasts forever hidden in the scrolls, buried for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. The Word of God stands forever. And so my belief in my Bible leads me simultaneously to my belief in my Lord Jesus Christ. He's my Lord and He's my Savior. Man has made so many vain efforts to try to destroy the Word of God. Tradition has dug a grave for it and attempted to bury it, but it lives on. It's been burned in great piles and great pyres and fires. It lives on. There have been Judases who've tried to destroy it with a kiss, but the Word of God lives on. There have been Peters who've denied it with curses and with oaths, and it lives on, for truth never dies. And so God would say through the psalmist, Psalm 119, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in the heavens. That's it. I remember not too ter very long ago there was a man who was involved in a little bit of a theological debate with someone else, and, and he said, well, I, I can see your point, but I don't know how to impress it upon my neighbor, and it had to do with healthful living for your interest's sake. I, I don't know how to make him see the importance of it all. And the other fellow said, why don't you just tell him God said don't do it? And so we sing together. God says it, and I believe it, and that settles it. That old-time religion, it's good enough for me. There was a man who wrote a book. He entitled his book, The Last Words of Saints and Sinners. And what he had done was travel to folks who were on their deathbeds, folks who knew they were dying and were perhaps able to put the distilled wisdom of a lifetime into the last words. And he wrote a fascinating book. And then he decided to go beyond that and to look at the lives and then the deaths of some other important men. One of those that he wrote a bit of biographical information about was a man by the name of Francois Voltaire. Not 
too long ago. Peggy and I stood beside his grave over in Paris. He was a philosopher. He lived from 1694 to 1778. And he said this about 1750. In 50 years, the Bible is going to be extinct. But you know what? Today, and after nearly everyone has forgotten Voltaire, the Bible is still the bestseller in all the world. And his biographer says that when Voltaire died, he died screaming, I'm going to the realm of the damned. And then there was Thomas Paine. He was an American patriot, and we owe him that. He lived in a little cabin there out of New Rochelle, New York. And from 1707 to 1809 was his life. He wrote a book that he entitled The Age of Reason, and he laughed at God and at religion and Christ, certainly. His biographer says he died screaming the name of Jesus, and his last sentence was, I'd give the world if I'd never written The Age of Reason. Lord, have mercy. Oh, God, have mercy. One of my indoor sports has been to read of English, the English literist Samuel Johnson, perhaps the best-known writer over in Great Britain. He had a buddy who sat at his feet and would drink in his words and then write them down. His name was Boswell. Boswell writes of his death, and I read it years and years ago. He said, Samuel Johnson, who denied God, died screaming with fear. And just across town at the same time, only blocks away, there was dying a Christian by the name of John Wesley. And his last words, said his wife, were these, best of all, God is with us. I've told you before, I have two kids that are nurses. And my son Troy would tell you how he hates to attend the death of one who's dying without faith. He said, it's terrible, it's frightening. You can see the fear in their eyes, and, and you can see the tension. You can see on the monitors their heart rate go up, and then they're dreading the unknown. And then I contrast that with the death of my own father. I was holding a meeting down in Medford, and I knew my dad was getting more and more sick. And so I called him up, and I said, Daddy, I'd like to come home. I'd like to be with you. My daughter, Tammy, was at his bedside just nearly around the clock. And my dad said, no, you stay. Stay and preach. I was talking to him as he died. Perfect peace have they that love thy word and nothing shall offend them. The Apostle Paul, in contrast to the others who died in fear, would write a letter to a young preacher by the name of Timothy. And in the first chapter, in the 12th verse, he said, I know the one in whom I believed, and I know that he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. I have confidence in my future with Jesus Christ. That's the Apostle Paul, fulfilled prophecy. The atheist, the agnostic, the infidel, they won't believe the Bible because it condemns their lifestyle. But on the other hand, the agnostics down in Hollywood and, uh, and in New York City and, elsewhere, and in this town are willing to place their faith in clover leaf, four leaf clovers, in crystal balls, in a rabbit's feet. And by the way, it wasn't so lucky for the rabbit, was it? Fortune tellers, mediums, necromancers, channelers, tarot cards, and fortune cookies, all very, very scientific, huh? Ah, the proof is in the prophecy. Some say the proof is in the pudding. I like to say the proof is in the prophecy. And so I'm going to have to hurry now. We're not going to be able to read it all, but I'm going to reference, and you go home and study it for yourself. Ezekiel chapter 26, verses 3 and 4. And then put also, will you, please, verses 14 and 19. And I'll give you the background of the story. There was a place called Tyrus over along the Mediterranean coast. <clears throat> and it was a sailor town. It was the New York City of its day. It was a port town, and it was desperately wicked. And God said, I'm going to destroy you. One of these days, I'm going to knock the place down, and it's never, never going to be rebuilt. That was God's warning. 
In 575, a guy by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, a young man, set out to rule the whole world, moved in against the place because he was upset with the folks there, and he destroyed the city, and the rubble was strewn over square acres. The folks who'd lived there decided they'd get the last laugh, and they got in boats and moved what was left out onto an island. But you remember now, God had said, I'm going to leave the place desolate and completely empty, and then it's going to be as flat as the top of a rock. They're going to scrape the dust from it, and the fishermen will lay there their nets. 225 before Christ, 250 years after Nebuchadnezzar's attack, there came a guy by the name of Alexander the Great, and he got really upset with the folks who were laughing at him out on the island. And guess what he did? He gathered up all of the stones and all of the columns and all of the broken rocks and rubble, and he had his soldiers begin to build a causeway. They built it out to the island a half mile away. And when they'd gotten the rubble in place, they needed some fill dirt, and so they scraped the tops of the rocks with dust pans and filled in the potholes. And the Word of God was fulfilled in exact and careful detail. You can count on what God says. And now let me tell you a little bit about my Lord Jesus so you can have some faith and some trust in Him, the prophet without honor. In John's Gospel, chapter 4, at verses 43 and 44, he referred to himself in that way, I am without honor in my own country. And he's without honor in a lot of countries still yet today. Jesus was up at Capernaum. We visited there on the screen a few evenings ago. And um, he, he worked wonderful miracles. He healed a lady, Peter's mother-in-law. He healed another lady who'd had uh, a bleeding problem for many, many years. He had healed a paralytic who was let down through the roof. He had raised back to life Jairus' daughter. And in spite of all of that, the folks rejected him. They would not accept him. And so Jesus said, Capernaum, you're going to be brought low. Today out in Capernaum, there are only snakes and spiders and scorpions. The place is desolate. It's empty. No one has lived there since the time of Christ. And then go with me, please, and find Jesus with his disciples on a hillside. It's called the Mount of Olives. They were headed to Bethany, and they sat down to rest. And as they looked back toward Jerusalem, they saw the temple. And the disciples said, Lord, isn't it beautiful? And he said, yes, it is. But one day, the place is going to be ransacked till not one stone is left upon another. About 40 years later, Titus Vespasian, who at the time was the most able general of all of Rome's legions, came to the city and took it apart. And the peoples of Jerusalem hid inside the temple. They were sure that they'd be safe inside God's house. So in mass, they went inside the temple. And there was a man among them who became a very trusted and trustworthy historian. His name was Flavius Josephus. Josephus said, I pled with them to give up. I pled with them to come out, but they stayed inside. And so Titus Vespasian put the torch to the place and burned it down. And the folks on the inside died in the fire crying, Ichabod, Ichabod, the glory of God has departed. And when the stones cooled and the ashes were nothing but embers now, the Romans dug up the stones, removed everyone, shoveled the dirt into strainers to recapture the gold that had fallen between the cracks. Jesus said not one stone would be left upon another. You can trust his word. Our Lord said heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will last forever. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I must make to you an appeal. That same Jesus said, He that hath the Son hath life. But he that hath not the Son hath not eternal life. I beg you tonight, if you haven't already done it, make him the Lord of your life. Not only one who separated B.C. from A.D., not only one who is important in history, but invite him to come and sit on your heart's throne. Make him your Savior, and at the same time, he'll be your very best friend. I read recently about the little boy who came from poverty and wanted so for a little red wheelbarrow for Christmas. And at the family circle, he would pray night after night, Oh, Jesus, just bring me a wheelbarrow, a little red wheelbarrow. And his parents scraped and saved and scraped and went without things, and they bought a little red wheelbarrow. And on Christmas morning, the little boy saw under the tree his heart's desire, and he took it outside. And, and without his coat, he went running up and down the streets, 
not far away, there in front of the church was a nativity scene. And sometime mid-morning, someone came into the pastor with the report, someone has stolen the doll from the nativity scene. And a bit later, a neighbor said, I saw a little boy with a little red wheelbarrow with a doll and going up and down the streets. And they went up and down the street, found the little guy, and surely enough, there was the nativity doll. And they said, son, what, what do you, why, why did you steal a little doll? Oh, no, he said, I didn't steal it. He said, I promised Jesus if he'd bring me a wheelbarrow, I'd give him the first ride. And what about you, huh? What about us? We give him the first ride, will we make him the supremacy of our lives, will we? He'll fill all of our needs, every one. Romans 1, uh, chapter 5, rather, Romans chapter 5, verse 1, there God says, Jesus will bring you peace. You want peace? He'll bring it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 57 says he'll bring us victory. You have a problem with temper, or drugs, or alcohol, or tobacco, he'll bring you victory. And Matthew chapter 1, 21 says he'll bring us salvation. He came to save his people from their sins. John chapter 15, verse 11 says he'll bring to us happiness and joy. Could you use some joy in your life? Best of all and most of all, he'll give us life eternal. I don't know. I can't understand how folks can go to the cemetery and bury there their hearts and their dreams, their spouse or their kids, and face life without Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your word, for your promise, for your presence. When we found you, we have found not only a friend and a comforter, but one who brings peace and victory and salvation and happiness in the interim. If there's one here tonight that hasn't accepted you as their best friend and their Savior, don't let them rest. Don't give them peace or contentment until they settle it with you. And then let us bask eternally in your sunlight, in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.